you know what made me decide to come here? It was the FBI raid. I thought that was the biggest abridgment to the First Amendment, maybe the history of this country. You chose this place because federal agents put me in handcuffs. Yeah. Very counterintuitive. Here's, here's an organization actually trying to tell the truth. In the first five days of working in this company, I had more conversations about ethical journalism than I did probably in the last 10 years of my career. You've gone from CNN. Look, the, the reality is I was there for 25 years, there for half my life. I gave blood, sweat, and tears to that company. I love the people there. But it got to a point where how it was being translated on our air wasn't what CNN was meant to be. Patrick, you've gone from CNN, field operations manager for the Washington, D.C. Bureau at CNN. Correct. And you have accepted a position as executive producer at Project Veritas. That is correct. And people might find that interesting. Yeah, I mean, look, the, the reality is I was there for 25 years, there for half my life. Um, I gave blood, sweat, and tears to that company. I love the company. Um, I, I, there's, you know, I love the people there. I still do. Um, there are some amazing journalists that still work there, people, both you know, in the office and, and out in the field especially. But it got to a point where what we were doing, it seemed like out in the field and gathering news, just how it was being translated on our air wasn't, wasn't what um, CNN was meant to be. Let's, let's go back to, to day one. I started in 95. Five. Uh, and my first job out of there was with uh, Bernard Shaw. Um, who was the voice of the first Gulf War. I mean, when the White House called all the journalists in Baghdad and, and told everyone to get out, CNN, that, that team, was very brave of them, said, we're not, we're not going. And to me, um, being in journalism school at the time and witnessing all this, that's where I want to work. I want to work for CNN. I want to work for the Washington Bureau of CNN. Hmm. I want to work for Bernard Shaw. So back in the day, CNN had a bunch of no-name anchors. We had a bunch of no-name talent. We would go out and cover footage from around the world. We'd go into war zones and everything and tell the news and let the video play hmm. and let the people at home decide for themselves. What were your duties in the, over the last 10 years that you worked there? For the Washington Bureau, it is overseeing everything that takes place outside of the Bureau. So it's the White House, it's Capitol Hill, it's the Pentagon, it's the State Department. I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but I've probably over the years set up or helped plan thousands of congressional hearings, what, 25 State of the Unions, multiple inaugurations that I oversaw. My job was to make the President of the United States look as good as I possibly could, and I did. This seems to be the video that everyone is talking about. The funny part about all of this is when you first laid the acorn tapes down. I was sitting in the newsroom at CNN. And that was yes. covered extensively on your network. Yeah. And you, you watched that unfold and what was going through your mind? I appreciated the fact that two young kids right out of college, you know, with their own money, right. you know, cobbled together a ridiculous pimp costume and, mm -hmm. and go out and seek out corruption or mm -hmm. you know, on their own. I thought it was great. I mean, you know, back in the day, investigative undercover journalism was that was that was the trade. We can't just keep taking press releases or, or just going to these press briefings and just listening to what these people tell us, the politicians and the you know, big corporations. We actually have to investigate what these people are doing. Um, and, and I feel like that just has gotten lost over the years. So. Enter Carrie Porch. Enter Carrie Porch. <laughs> Carrie Porch worked uh, in the field, part of the group that I oversaw. Unbeknownst to me, he had been recording in CNN for, I guess, several months uh, before he started contacting me. And we become, you know, friendly. And uh, he kept asking me for, like, mentorship advice. So we get together. I would say if he and I talked for an hour, 50 minutes of it was all about how to be a good husband, how to be a good father, um, career advice, you know, all, all that sort of stuff is what I was giving him. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until, like, the last 10 minutes of the conversation where we, we actually switched to work. And so Kerry where, was recording you? He was recording me the entire time. Did I you know you were being recorded? I had no idea. No, no idea? No. So you were called into an office. Before. You saw this tape and you go, ah. Yeah. Oh. Yes. It dawned upon knew. you in that moment that it was an undercover investigation and you were an unwitting whistleblower, so Correct. to speak. Yes. We could be so much better than we are. Well, and you learn that in journalism school. We're supposed to be middle of the road. That's our job. Now it's just, now it's just entertainment, it's all it's become. There is no true media news outlet. And that, you all realize that instantaneously? Yeah. And, and what, how did that feel? Yeah, I was pretty upset with him, right? Because, you know, I trusted him. He was a friend. Right. The only regret I have is that a friend of mine duped me, right? I'm like one of the most street smart people I know. 
and a friend of mine duped me. Carrie was, duped you. That's yeah, what Carrie you duped me. And that was like that was it was almost like a moment of embarrassment for me that someone got me. I was I more I was more embarrassed about that than the comments that came out. Hello. Hey, Patrick, James O'Keefe. Good. Do you have a few minutes? Before Project Redis published a story, I actually called you. Yes. And for comment. As a we, good journalist, actually call someone <laughs> before you do the story. Which is what we did. To ask for comment. And I basically said, I don't disagree that news organizations claiming to be middle of the road, who aren't middle of the road, um, should be, you know, called out for it. So I'm sitting there having this conversation with you going, I do not disagree with your premise. I just hate that it's me. I'm talking off the record here, but you did in fact make these comments. It's on tape. And if it's going to ruin your career for telling the truth, I want to talk to you on the record about it. That could only help from my perspective. I went back to my boss and I said, I'd love to sit down with him. I'm not afraid of him. You know, I mean, like what everyone, thinks, everyone thinks you're like the boogeyman. I'm like, you should let me talk to him. Let me defend our network. And what did he let say? me defend myself. What did he say? Jeff Sucker wants this to go away as quickly as possible. And the only way for this to go away is for you to be quiet. You are not permitted to talk to him. Jeff Sucker. On, on the record. Jeff Sucker wanted it to go away. Yeah, he just wanted this whole CNN thing to go away. You guys had already dropped a bunch of tapes and there was, you know, more coming. And the buck stops with him. And he, you know, like we've had other, like I've been through so many presidents now. Some that are just so hands off that you don't even hear from them for a month. You know what I mean? He's involved every day has a plan, whatever. I just don't agree with it. So you did not know this at the time, but at Project Veritas, we had a robust internal ethics debate about whether to publish your story. We use your case as an example of a, of a case study in the ethics curriculum because you're not a villain. And most of the time when we expose someone, you know, people are harmed, sometimes good people, when I called him to ask for him for comment, he was picking his daughter up from school. He said, James, please don't release this tape. When you and I were talking on the phone that oh. night, and I was basically saying, dude, don't do this. Like, don't right. release this so tape. So it's a tough call. It's a, it's, a, it's a really difficult call. He's not a villain. He's not a bad guy. Whitebeard had to betray his own, I wouldn't call him a friend, but mm -hmm. trusted colleague. Do we publish this yes or no? Does this rise to a vital public interest? What do you guys think? And our team seemed to come down on the issue that you were a 25-year veteran at CNN. And because of the enormous power that CNN has in the world at large to tell the truth, they're the most trusted name in news, your words carried tremendous weight. <laughs> and then the story went out. The motto that CNN put out earlier this year, the facts first, that's what I want the news to be. That's what it should be. That's what it used to be. Yeah, it was just, it was kind of a, a very surreal, bizarre thing. Don Trump Jr. retweeted it, and that got a million views, and then I was getting phone calls from all over, like, I have friends all Don over the world. Don Trump Jr. retweeted your, yes. your video. So we go in this meeting, this manager's meeting, and I'd never seen in all my years that conference room as packed as it was, like standing room only. At the very end of the meeting, I said, can I have the floor? And he said, sure. And I stood up, and I addressed the room, and I said, look, here's the deal. Um, I have worked here for 25 years. I love this company. Okay, I've given blood, sweat, and tears to this company. I slept under my desk during the Reagan funeral. Pulled to George Costanza, all the men and women behind the scenes, you know, busting their ass every single day to go out and cover the news, putting their lives on the line, whether it was a war zone or a hurricane or whatever. Like, I've, I've been in some dangerous situations with some of these people before, and I know how much they care about getting the story and getting it to the people. I don't agree with what we put on our air, but that, but that shouldn't be a bad thing. We should actually be able to have differing opinions. That's the beauty of working in a place like CNN, where we can have differing viewpoints, right? We should be able to have those conversations. And I, everyone applauded. I was shocked. I mean, I owned my words. You and owned I told your that. words, and they applauded you for it yes. at CNN. Right. That's going to surprise a lot of people. Yeah, maybe. You know, people came up to me after the meeting. They were like, that was one of the most heartfelt um, and passion, you know, things that anyone's ever said around here. The amount of support I had made me feel great. It really did. It made me feel like, okay, I'm not, I'm not alone. I obviously wasn't because there, was, there were other managers and other staff that you guys recorded saying the same thing. You say the people at the network are so hardworking, and I understand where you're coming from, but I can already see the comment section. I could already hear the, the but, you know, the way that things are portrayed on television. The chirons are almost goofy. It's become a laughing stock.
Some reports came out that Cuomo was in trouble, the governor of New York, and the network was timing their coverage in order to help the governor of New York. This is all coming out now. Right. It's, it's hard to justify, but if you're asking if an organization like CNN can get back to being the gold standard of, of doing news, they can. It's not going to be easy. It's going to take a lot to earn people's trust and to get your what credibility back. What has to back. happen at, at the organization? I, I go back to the Bernard Shaw you know, rule. Um, if you have given just even a smidge that you might be portrayed as uh, leaning one way or the other, their credibility shot at that point. When we get to a point where we have on election night massive studio that was designed and built for 16 talking heads, it's, it's, it's just too much, it's overkill. I would have a totally different business model if I was running a network today. I would put all as much money as possible into the journalists that are actually going out in the field and gathering the news, producers, reporters, uh, Cruise, but that's you know, too expensive. That that's that's. It's, but it's but it's probably a lot less expensive than these you know huge show staffs and these high paid anchors. We we met up in Annapolis in the fall of 2021. Right. And you and I had a face to face conversation for I think the first time ever. Mm -hmm. It was kind of funny how that meeting even happened because you and I had been kind of going back and forth a little bit and then. 10 o'clock on like a Friday night or something. And I get this frantic text from you going, why aren't you at work right now? Why aren't you, you know, I'm here, you know, doing your work and da 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 I was like, dude, you got the wrong person. What are you, what are you doing? You know? And you're like, oh, sorry. And I'm like, you know what? We should sit down and talk. It's no. been two years. You, you and I sat down uh, in an Irish pub in Annapolis for a few hours and talked about everything. It occurred to me in our meeting that, wow, this guy might make a good a good lead producer role for Project Veritas that we both assessed each other. And you came up to New York. The New York Times reporting the FBI Saturday searched the home of James O'Keefe. Do you know what made me decide to come here? It was the FBI raid. I thought that was the biggest abridgment to the First Amendment probably in maybe the history of this country, right? For the FBI to go blowing into the doors of uh, journalists. It was unheard of. They were raiding your home. You chose this place because federal agents put me in handcuffs. Yeah. That might seem counterintuitive to many people. I would imagine most people, after hearing about the raid, probably would run the other direction. So you chose to be an executive producer at an organization which got raided by the FBI because you were upset about it. And, and uh, you thought it was a violation of the First Amendment. Correct. Hmm. Very counterintuitive. Here's, here's an organization actually trying to tell the truth. In the first five days of working in this company, I had more conversations about ethical journalism than I did probably in the last 10 years of my career. Should we do this story? Should we not do this story? How should we go about this story? You know, this might harm this person. And we know journalism harms people. Right? But sometimes there's a way to go about something. It, it just dawned on me. I was like, it was just so refreshing. It was a team of people, you know, the, the amazing researchers and journalists that actually work here. I mean, it's a young team, but they, but they love journalism. They love getting to the bottom of things. Now I've offered you a full-time <laughs> position yeah. at Project Veritas to be the executive producer after what I see is a qualified, capable, competent person who's gained the respect of people here. Um, and you've accepted that position, mm -hmm. just so the world knows. Right. Um, is objective journalism possible? Absolutely. It is. I think, I think objective journalism is absolutely possible. How so? And we've proved it here many times. Um, we've, what is objective well, journalism? It's, it's being able to put your own personal beliefs and thoughts and ideas. So you can bring your life experiences to the table, especially as a journalist, but I, I've never uh, aligned myself with the party. I'm never, I don't think I'll ever register with a party. Um, and I don't think journalists should. Um, I think our job is to try to stay as middle of the road as possible. You can vote however you want, but when you're actually involved in a story with a candidate or a corporation or a drug company or whatever it may be, um, you have to put that journalist hat on. You have to put that wall up and you have to set your personal politics aside. What do you hope to accomplish here? I hope to accomplish uh, us doing more, bigger, better stories to get back into more investigative type journalism. This is the thing that I've learned in, in the months of being here. Everyone's, you know, very dedicated people. 100% buy-in 
But the beauty of it is, is, is we can save a little girl one night or do like a, a Pentagon Papers one night. And 24 hours later, we're doing you know, dry ramen noodles, you know, going after Rachel Maddow. What I'm doing right now is either brilliant or it's crazy, or maybe it's a little right. bit of both, right? Maybe, maybe it's, it's a little, little both. both. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty wild how it's all kind of come full circle.